Welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us for today's History at High Noon program, Graveyard of the Atlantic. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History and we're so glad that you're joining us for today's lunchtime lecture program. Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org where you can learn more about our exciting upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. This is also where you can find more information about joining our wonderful North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Um, our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like today's program possible. A few quick housekeeping items for today. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our adult programs intern Phoebe will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome today's speaker, Joe Schwartzer, who is the director of the North Carolina Maritime Museum System, which is, which is a division of state history museums for the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. So Joe, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Welcome, thank you for being with us today. Delighted to be here. Okay. All right. Uh, well, as, as Stacy said, I'm the director of the North Carolina Maritime Museum System. Uh, there are three maritime museums, uh, Hatteras, Beaufort, and Southport. And they're along one of probably the richest portions of submerged cultural history in the world. It's really quite remarkable. And uh, I think the first thing to do is when did it first become known as a graveyard of the Atlantic? Well, that's a relatively simple question to answer would be David Stick's book, first published in 1952. It was enormously popular, the name stuck, and ever since then, the waters off our coast have been known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. But it was unknown to mariners way before that. So let's look at, take a look at some of these maps. Wait a minute, we seem to have a little problem here. Okay. Uh, the earliest map we have is by Juan de la Cosa, who sailed with Columbus, uh, and it dates to around 1500. Now, you have to get used to how they did these early maps. This is the, lower, the southern section of North America. Central America is over here, and this is South America. Florida is remarkably small, as you can see, but there is Cape Hatteras. Now, we go ahead 26 years, and here is a map from Giovanni de Verzano, from his voyages in 1524. And you can see that Florida has grown considerably and Hatteras is still prominently located on this chart. Then in 1585, we have John White's watercolor, which is really quite good. And it gives much more details of this area. And I think even today you could recognize that as being the Outer Banks. This gets picked up by Theodore de Bray in 1591 in his volume one of Great Voyages. It was published in English, French, and German. And again, now we see Hatterisk right along in here. And then 1795, a map produced in England. Uh, again, Cape Hatteras. This time it's noted as Cape Hatteras. And then a little more recently, the Burnside Expedition in 1862. Um, and again, now as you've got Cape Hatteras, again, prominently located. So. For centuries before it was known as the Graveyard of Atlantic, it was simply referred to as Cape Hatteras. As a matter of fact, we have a really remarkable letter here from a young, uh, at the time, a young Lieutenant of the 114th New York Volunteer Infantry from Monday, uh, December 8th. And it's important because he's writing home, he was part of the, of the uh, fleet going down to be part of the Red River campaign in 1862 and he writes home and I'm not gonna read you the whole letter because it goes on for several pages, but there are excerpts that are well worth it. Dear parents, I write once more after going through what I never want to again. We left Fortress Monroe on Thursday the 4th. The wind began to rise till it blew a gale and we were pitching and rolling lively. About this time, we got off that place dreaded by all sailors, Cape Hatteras, when all at once our engine broke down. I've always wanted to see a storm at sea, but I never want to see another, not that I know of. You can't imagine the sight of a storm at sea, 
It is perfectly awful. No pen can describe it, at least I can't. All I can say it was sublime and terrific. Now, if I can only see a battle, I shall be all right. Daniel Knowlton saw many battles. He was promoted to captain for his courage at Fort Port Hudson. And sadly, he was killed in action at the Battle of Cedar Creek on October 19th, 1864. But you can see that for 400 years, just the name, Cape Hatteras, said all that mariners needed to hear about what the dangers they could anticipate. And there are a number of factors that create those dangers. First of all, currents. Well, we have the mid-Atlantic mid bite coming down from the north, the South Atlantic shelf water coming up from the south. We have what's known as a Hatteras front. Now, what's interesting about these currents is they have, first of all, they're, they're, they're brackers. They have varying degrees of salinity and they go from the mainland down out into deep water. Uh, Hatteras front does the same thing, but you also have the shelf break current, which is jet, the shelf break jet, which is a branch of the Labrador current coming down from the north, and of course the Gulf Stream coming up from the south. Now, aside from creating a number of shoals, and you can see them here, uh, you've got the Platte Shoals, that's probably the, the most recent one, uh, but you have Wimble Shoals, Diamond Shoals, uh, Kinnikeet Shoals, uh, et cetera, all along in here. And these shoals shift constantly. So in other words, even with GPS, you really can't tell where they're going to be. You have a, an approximation. So that's another hazard in navigation. Now added to that, and this is interesting, these um, uh, Southern uh, Atlantic Bight shelf waters and Northern Atlantic Bight shelf waters, as I said, have different degrees of salinity. That's important if, you, if you're a ship that's been ballasted for salt water, because if you sail into fresh water or water that isn't as saline, the buoyancy of the ship ships and you can easily find yourself awash or even sunk. So that's another factor. So you've got the currents, the varying salinity, the, um, the uh, uh, shoals coming up. And then of course you have catastrophic weather. This is just a picture of Hurricane Isabel. And uh, these three natural factors combine to make some of the most dangerous waters known in the world. But you also have human factors. You have piracy, you have warfare, and even today you have navigational error. Now, what's interesting is that because of those currents, Sailing ships, even from the earliest period of exploration, traveled the current simply because it was faster. They could pick up three or four knots. And even if they hit the doldrums with no wind whatsoever to fill the sails, the ship was still moving. And in early, early seafaring days, that was, could make the difference between life and death for your crew. Um, so you had to keep moving. So naturally, if all the merchant vessels and all the, all the vessels going up north and south are following this current, it's going to be a center for piracy. It's going to be a center for warfare, even, even after the age of sail. And navigational error still occurs. And consequently, you have these maps. Now, this is the earliest one that I've, I've seen. This is published by National Geographic in the late 60s, early 70s. Here's a more recent one. Now, if you were to count all these wrecks along in here, uh, following the coastline all the way down, you'd find there are a little over 600 wrecks. The reason that's significant is if you, if you go from Oregon Inlet, which is right about here, down to the end tip of Portsmouth Island, which is right about here, yeah, right about there. If you took all these chips and focused them off that section of the coast alone, Oregon Inlet down to Portsmouth Island, and multiply them by three, you'd still be 200 short. There are in fact over 2000 shipwrecks off the coast of off the coast of the Outer Banks. And they range over a period of 400 years. The earliest one being the Tiger, which ran aground. I test technically it's not a shipwreck, but it ran aground, suffered a great deal of damage. They had to beach her and, and a repair her, and she lost a good deal of the provisions. Uh, next one we know of is the, what may well be the HMS John. It's an unknown wreck. It's called the Corolla wreck right now. Um, and it dates to around 1652, perhaps, if it is in fact the HMS John. Uh, the Monitor, very, very famous shipwreck from 1862, um, December 31st, 1862. Uh, the USS Huron from November 24th, 1877. 
The Priscilla, which was uh, caught in the San Sariaco storms of 1899 and uh, it led to one of the most famous life-saving um, episodes um, recorded. You have the infamous ghost ship of Diamond Shoals, the Carol A. Deering, which uh, came ashore in January 31st, 1921. You have U-boats from World War I and World War II. We have four U-boats from World War II off our coast. Did a great deal of damage in 1942, sinking 78 ships along our coast in a mere, in a mere six months. And yes, even today, like last, last week, like during Hurricane Ian, um, came ashore north of Oregon Inlet, uh, the uh, sailing vessel Catalyst. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing situation, and now it's known as the Graveyard of Atlantic. But still, Cape Hatteras will be recognized by most mariners. Now, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit because I've told you that there are 400 years of wrecks on the Outer Banks, and indeed there are. But we have some in indication there may be older wrecks, although that's really highly speculative. But the reality is we have some 19 ancient coins that were found along the beach, and I'll get to that in a minute. And of those 19, there are, are um, six here that are particularly interesting. Um, the coins come from a collection, the Catherine and William E. Uh, William E. and Catherine E. Selk, F. Sell collection. Uh, William Shell was a successful businessman in Pennsylvania, and he used to come down, he started coming down the Outer Banks in the 30s to do um, uh, surf fishing with his friends. And to hear him tell it, um, when they weren't fishing, his friends were drinking and playing cards, and he didn't drink and he didn't play cards. So he had to have something to do. So he'd walk along the beach and in the dunes behind the beach and pick up things he thought were interesting. Now, a lot of these coins you'd expect. These first ones up here are, are eight real pieces. And then you have various trade dollars and things like this, which aren't too exceptional. But then you start getting into some of these, a hemidractum from the time of Ptolemy IV, Panic Philippator from 221 to 205 BC. Um, a drachm from uh, the reign of King Aziz uh, in, from a kingdom which is now, in, would have been in, in modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan, dating to around 35, BC to AD 5. A pruta, which is minted in the year 6 in uh, the prefecture of Caponius under the Emperor Augustus, that would be in, in what is now modern day Israel. Um, a silver uh, uh, coin from the uh, Emperor uh, Hadrian, uh, and a what's called a folis or fortinumi piece from the emperor uh, 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 Theodosius Tiberius from 588. And then we have another silver coin from uh, the Levon I uh, of 1198. Now, the question immediately arises, what are these coins doing here? And when we're in the museum, visitors look at them like, oh, you mean there were Egyptian and Roman ships that were wrecked on the coast? Well, the answer to that is probably not. Now, to be fair, the ancient chronicles are often record ships that pass through the Pillars of Hercules, which is now known as Straits of Gibraltar, and simply disappeared, never seen, for, seen again. And uh, so theoretically, could a ship have been blown, caught in a storm, blown off course, and wound up off of our base? Yes, theoretically it could. It's not terribly probable, but it's possible. So when I've dashed that hope in their, in their hearts, uh, the next question is, oh, could it be pirate treasure? Again, Probably not, uh, because pirates certainly wouldn't have thrown away silver coins and the copper coins would have entered them. A far more logical explanation is that this, these coins are simply scooped up in foreign harbors when ships were taken on ballast. And when the ships wrecked along our coast, it got spilled out with everything else. And that's how these coins got here. But one never really knows. Now, aside from shipwrecks, we also deal with an, an a maritime cultural landscape. We have four lighthouses, Currituck, Body Island, Cape Hatteras, and Ocracoke. We have life-saving stations, such as Pea Island, Richard Ethers, and, and the all-black uh, uh, life-saving crew. Kennekeet Station, of course, Chickamacomico Station, which is the last really surviving uh, early life-saving station on our coast, um, and uh, the Weather Bureau. Uh, which is in Hatteras and was used to uh, report weather on the Outer Banks. And then, of course, you had the communities themselves. So the museums really cover a great deal of territory. And hence, our, our 
our recognition is one historic coast and three unique museums. Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, the one in Beaufort, and the one in Southport. And here they are, Beaufort, Southport, Hatteras. Well, today we're gonna to talk about the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, North Carolina, and there it is. You can see it's adjacent to the ferry stop going over to Ocracoke. It's right there, not far from the beach. And uh, it's been open now since 2002. Now I'm showing you this simply because I wanted to show you some of the construction, which isn't as obvious uh, in, the, in the finished building. We knew we had to design something for catastrophic weather, and we did. The walls are poured concrete. They're double reinforced, 16 inches on center. They were over a foot and a half thick, and they go down another 11 feet below grade, below this, this, this level right here. They're on a building platform that is 12 feet above sea level. And the walls themselves sit on, on bases, which are five feet square and go all the way around the building. So it's a very strong building and it's built specifically for catastrophic weather, uh, including the roof and all other aspects of the, of the building itself. So we took every precaution we could to make sure that we were ready. The sign incorporates the the, the propeller from the USS Dionysus, which is one of the first ships used to create artificial reefs off our coast. And of course, we deal with a great range of topics, which I was talking about earlier, such as the Civil War, history of diving, piracy, General William Billy Mitchell, charter fishing, World War I and World War II, US Life Saving Service, Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, and of course, shipwrecks. The, current, the, the, the original first order, order Fresnel lens from the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is currently on display in the museum. Uh, this is a fascinating story. Um, once it was declared redundant, and that was in the, in the early 40s, it was simply left and abandoned until it was deeded over to the Park Service. During the period it was abandoned, a lot of people took souvenirs. That's why a lot of the lenses are, are missing. Uh, and, uh, but the reason it's, it's, its history is so interesting is because during the Civil War, the Confederate government removed all the aids navigation from our coast. This was one of them. And it became a priority for Union forces to recover these. And uh, so in 1861, it was dismantled, taken out of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, moved to, to the mainland, um, probably via Washington and then back up into Henderson, North Carolina, where it was stored. And, um, and it, was, it was there for, for, uh, throughout the war. And it, it suddenly appeared on a railway siding in August of 1865, was sent back to uh, France for recalibration and repair then sent again to Baltimore, where it was put in storage in 1866, I believe, could have been 67. And it sat there until it was time for a new lens to be put in the newly constructed lighthouse, um, which was built in, in the 1870s. Um, what's, what's interesting about that is they requested the first order for an L lens and they sent this one down, but no one bothered to tell them it was the original 1854 lens from the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. So there it sat doing its job all until 1940 and no one knew it was the original lens. Uh, so we're very pleased to have that on display in the museum. We also deal with the Civil War. We're very proud to be part of the uh, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom because of the Hotel de Afrique, which is located not far from the museum's present site. And also because of the actions of uh, an all African American gun crew, black gun crew, on um, the USS Monticello when during the attacks on Fort Harrison Clark in early 1862. This is the original flag from the Monticello, and along the the hoist, it's inscribed in in gold wire. It says USS Monticello, Lieutenant Commander Brain, and he was in charge of the vessel during that assault on Fort Harrison Clark. We also deal with World War One and World War Two. And you can see here, first of all, World War I, the incident of the U-140 uh, sinking the light ship Diamond Shoals, LV-72. And, um, and then, of course, the historic Merlot rescue, which is covered also at the 
at the historic site of Chickamacomico, which is just up the road from the museum. And the remarkable feat it was to rescue those men uh, uh, during World War I. Uh, this is the bell from the, recovered from the lightship uh, by uh, local divers and through agreement with the Coast Guard is on display in the museum. And then we also have go to World War II. Now this is, this is really when U-boat warfare really struck home because you had no fewer than 14 U-boats conducting operations off the Outer Banks in, in 1942 and 43. Um, these artifacts are from the U-85, which was not only the first, one of the first U-boats to be in action off our coast, it was also the first U-boat sunk by the United States in World War II. And you can see the Enigma machine, which is an encoding machine, which is capable of a 150 quadrillion combinations in terms of, of coding. And um, they're, the machines themselves are quite rare. This one is just obviously all the more special because it is from the U-85 itself. Uh, we have a number of objects from the submarine and also from the Coast Guard Auxiliary that was signed a task along with the Navy of stopping the incursions of the, of the uh, uh, U-boats. Uh, and we have two recovered manuals uh, from a U-85. One is a, a guide to the coast of Norway and another from the west coast of Ireland. And that was where her shakedown cruise was. And these were recovered from the wreck and conserved and they're, they're quite visible now. So we're, we tell this entire story and the story of the uh, devastation these U-boats wreaked on, on American forces in, in the early 1942. But we have other things we talk about. Vintage charter fishing and diving equipment. Charter fishing is a major industry on the Outer Banks. I'm sure you all know that. Uh, that's a world uh, record holding marlin. Uh, we have displays here from um, uh, Ernie's, Ernie Froster's uh, albatross fleet and other uh, fishing uh, groups on the Outer Banks. Uh, we have diving equipment uh, from hard hat all the way through scuba uh, from Jim Christopher's collections. Uh, and these are important because they they really show a whole another industry that's going on and still very vital on the Outer Banks, and also a very popular uh, force bringing tourists to our area, which is diving. But we have a number of mysteries. Now I mentioned the mystery of the Carol A. Deering, which still remains a great unsolved maritime mystery of the 20th century. Uh, she was simply found on. Uh, Diamond Shoals in 1921, her sail set, no one on, on board, no one ever knows what happened to the crew, uh, and uh, that's all there was to it. But we have other mysteries, such as this portrait of Theodosia Burr Alston. Uh, Theodore, Theodosia was the daughter of Aaron Burr, and she was on her way back from South Carolina to visit her father in New York, who was returning from Europe. She was on board a ship called the Patriot, she left home in 1813 and neither she nor the ship were ever seen again. Now, what's interesting is this portrait, which she, she was theoretically taking to her father as a gift. Many people thought it was done by John Vanderlyn, probably not. More likely it may have been done by her brother-in-law, uh, Austin, who was a, a very famous uh, maritime artist and did a few portraits, but not many. And he may have done this one. That would be interesting to pursue. Uh, but the question arises, how did this portrait wind up in Nag's head? Um, and that's, that's part of the mystery, because first of all, it's been identified definitely as being Theodosia Burr. It was definitely found in Nag's head um, back in the 1920s. Uh, it was uh, conserved and is on display, I think, at Yale University now. But the, the question remains, was, was she simply lost at sea? Did she go down with the Patriot? And we still haven't known where, where that wreck is. Was she put, theoretically washed ashore because she had escaped uh, the, the, the storm that was going on and made it ashore, suffering from amnesia? Was she drowned? What happened? Um, early theories thought that she might have been the victim of piracy and sold into, into slavery. But there was a 20 knot gale blowing at the time the Patriot was, was, was recorded missing, and no pirate in his right mind would have attempted att attacking another ship in that kind of weather. So that's highly doubtful. So it's far more likely that the Patriot got caught in a squall and went down 
but as to how the portrait got to Nag's head, that we still don't know. There are other mysteries, such as this one, the so-called Titanic telegram. Now, this is interesting because this was found wadded up in the walls of the Weather Bureau station when the National Park Service is doing the restoration. And it is a, it's a legitimate telegram from 1912. And the text is quite clear. It reports a CQD, which is the early distress signal, earlier than SOS, um, being brought out. And it gives the location of the Titanic. She's reporting that she is sinking and, um, uh, and distressed. Um, the question arises as to whether this is a legitimate telegram or not, simply because of variations in time um, and, and who was on duty at the time. Um, it, it's difficult to say one way or the other. Uh, there's no question that the, that the telegram itself is authentic, but whether, it's, whether it is a, a authentic distress signal that was picked up by um, the Marconi radio station and then relayed to the weather station, which had a wire, a, a, a wire um, uh, to the mainland. Um, is it, that's what we still, we still don't know. And it's a topic for discussion. Um, interestingly, the legend goes that it was, it was sent to New York and it was intercepted and told uh, they were uh, get off the line. They were uh, obviously drunk. They didn't know what they're talking about and they were just clogging up the line. And um, uh, theoretically, um, that station that received it um, was, was, was telling them not to send any more transmission, but that station had been closed down at 10 o'clock that night. So it couldn't have been uh, that station. And it turns out that just as today, we had hackers back then, and it may have been intercepted by a hacker and that may have been the response they received. We still don't know. We're researching it, but it's it's great fun and a good and a good question and mystery to follow up on. Um, one of the things our visitors really enjoy is what we call the visible collection storage, uh, separated from the main galleries by a window. But they can look in and see all sorts of artifacts that are in storage on display. We try to pull things out that we don't have on display all that often, uh, and have, let people have a good look at them and 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 talk about them. Um, in addition to that, we have a number of programs. We have what we call the Salty Dogs Lecture Series, which covers all sorts of topics, diving, piracy, marine life, history, shipwrecks, archeology. span We also have ones that are obviously more popular with some, and that is the uh, uh, What's for Supper. Uh, uh, Sharon Peel Kennedy is a great chef, uh, expert in Outer Banks cooking, and uh, her lectures are always well-received. And then we have Sam Green, who was uh, at the museum every week creating uh, canvas back duck decoys. Now this is really kind of a lost art um, on the Outer Banks. And people are always fascinated by seeing what he creates is, 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 is decoys are really works of art and they're, they're great fun. Now, in addition to that, we have maritime crafts for kids. What's fascinating about these programs is that we often find as many adults taking them as we do kids, but they're very popular. Then we have the British War Grave Ceremony, which we have every May 12th and 13th to commemorate the loss of uh, the crew of the HMS Bedfordshire, who were uh, later recovered, their bodies were recovered and buried on Ocracoke. And also the two crew members of the San Delfino who were buried in the cemetery at Buxton in the National Park there. We have the museum store, which has proven very popular with all of our visitors. And coming in 2024, uh, thanks to the uh, North Carolina legislature and uh, Dare County and the Dare Outer Banks Visitors Bureau, uh, we have been able to obtain funds to allow us to do a complete exhibit upfit. We've never, we've always been doing temporary exhibits and now we'll be able to install our more permanent exhibits, show a broader range of our artifacts and tell more stories. We're quite excited about that. Um, We'll be obviously have a flexible schedule in 2023, but in 2024, we hope to open up with a whole new, uh, whole new exhibit scheme. And so that's the Great Atlantic Museum. It's um, North Carolina and our partners, National Park Service, NOAA, Dare County, uh, uh, and of course the Outer Banks Visitors Tourism Board. And um, that's all we have for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was incredible. Um, I think our 
intern, uh, Phoebe, is going to ask you some questions. Sure. And a reminder to our um, all of our folks joining us, if you have questions for Joe, please put them into the chat, and we will make sure that they get answered. Okay. Let's see what we Nice comments. Good. What questions have we got? Um, we don't have any comments from the chat so far, um, but I, well, while we wait, I can ask you some things, but I was just wondering oh, what, one, man. Look at that. what the, what has been like the most like rewarding part of like working with this museum? I beg your pardon? What has been the most rewarding part of working with this museum? Oh, well, I, I think, I think probably, um, that's a very good question, and, and the answer is probably somewhat unexpected. Um, I spend a great deal of time in, in, in doing office work, et cetera, and I don't get to, in, to interface with the public as much as I'd like to. Um, but when I am able to, at, at, at each of the three museums, what's most rewarding is when you have people leaving the museum, and they're talking to each other, and you hear them say, I had no idea all that happened off here. This is so fascinating. I really have to learn more about that. And oddly enough, that kind of a comment is more common than you would think. I also have a great deal of fun working with the staff. We've got a terrific staff. Uh, they're, they're extremely talented, they're very versatile. And I think they're as dedicated to telling these stories as, as I am, uh, maybe in some cases more so. And uh, so we're always looking for new, uh, new stories and new, new things to tell the public. One of, one of the things we're researching at the Graveyard of Land Museum is we had a, um, uh, a in a Civil War exhibit, we have a um, uh, story of a young man uh, who had escaped from slavery and uh, was at the Hotel de Afrique and he used to watch the, the Union soldiers of the Hawkins Zouaves, the 9th New York Volunteer Infantry drill. And it got so that he knew the drills better than they did. And so the, the, the officers in charge had him dr actually drill the soldiers every morning. And they got him his own uniform. He sort of became a child of the regiment. And um, we, have, we have that story as far as we can tell it on display, but we're researching to find out what happened to him after the ninth New York left, what what did what? And all we have is the, is the name they, they gave him the name York, probably because it was short for New York, um, as and he was he was part of their regiment. But um, I am quite certain his life would be absolutely fascinating. And we're doing all we can to study that and find out what the what the rest of the story is. But that's just one of many stories that are that are just fascinating. Um, one of our board members <laughs> once was during a during one of the storms was uh, in uh, a local restaurant getting pizza for her boys, and they were all sitting at the table and they were young boys and they get restless. So to settle them down, she started to tell them a story of a shipwreck that their their great grandfather had been involved in in terms of rescuing. And she gets almost to the end of the story. And, and they say, okay, your pizza's ready. And she stands up to go and all the tables around her said, wait, wait, what happened? <laughs> so she had to finish the story. It's, it's that, kind of, that kind of connection of, 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 of people to these stories of, of uh, human beings on, on, a, on a really a ragged edge of survival. And also the communities, how they developed and how they responded to these uh, tragedies is, is always interesting. That is awesome. Thank you so much for, for your answer. Um, one of our attendees, Sasha, asks, well, first she says thanks um, from Raleigh for such a great program. But she also asks, with modern navigational technology, what is the frequency of shipwrecks today compared to the era of sail? Okay, all right. Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Obviously, the most recent, for instance, with the, with the wreck of the catalyst, if it's still there at the north end of Oregon Inlet, yes, you can see it. The older shipwrecks that are on, a lot of them are on the beach. Now, in 1920s, the National Geographic had a reporter go down and walk about a, a mile along uh, the beach in front of Hatteras Village, and he counted 21 individual shipwrecks. Now, 
they're probably still there, but they're probably also under about 20 feet of sand. And periodically, these wrecks surface and, and are visible, and then they sink back down in sand again. Probably the most, most notable of those would be the GA Kohler, uh, which is up, up mm, slightly north of Frisco. And, um, and uh, then there's also what was known as the Flambeau wreck, which is just off of Flambeau Road in Hatteras Village. Periodically, they will, they will get exposed just by, by current and weather. Um, you'll see during the summer, you'll find people sunbathing on where that wreck is. And then by February, it's all laid bare with metal fasteners sticking up and everything else. So it's, it's really bit by bit. Uh, you never know what, what wreck is going to be visible at any one time. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from John, and he asked, how did the name Hatteras come about? How, how did the what? The name Hatteras. Oh, the name, oh, the name Harris. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not an expert on this, but I can tell you, looking at the maps, most of the maps start out saying Hatteras, with a K at the end. I believe it's, it's related to the Hatteras Indians. Uh, who lived along the coast at this time. And they simply refer to it as Hatteras. Also, there's another island called Croatoan, which is, is, refers to the in, particular Indian group that was living there. That's where I think the name comes from. And, it, and Hatteras is essentially a, a corruption of Hatteras. That's very interesting. Um, we have one more question. Um, and Sasha asks, do the maritime museums have any part or association with the group that is currently working to restore the frying pan tower? Is there a, uh, okay, I got some of that, not all of it. I can, I can repeat. Do the maritime museums have any part or association with the group that is currently working to restore the frying pan tower? No, we don't. Uh, no, we don't. Um, and I, and I have to tell you, I've got nothing but respect for that group. I would not try to restore. <laughs> That's an enormous job. And, uh, and no, we don't have any affiliation with them. We wish them all the luck in the world, but that's, that's quite a project to take on. Absolutely. Um, Stacy, do you have anything that you would like to add or ask? No, I think we pretty much covered it all. Yeah, I think we've got it all. Thank you, Phoebe. And thank you so much, Joe. This, uh, we know that you are a busy, busy person. So thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Well, I, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was great fun. Uh, and thank you to all those of you who joined us today. Um, we invite you to please take time to visit um, either Beaufort, South, Southport, or Hatteras, or all three of the Maritime. All three, Academy. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> They're fabulous. You will not be disappointed. Um, and we hope to see all of you at our next adult program, uh, Museum After Dark Women of Country Music. That's taking place on the evening of October 28th, which will be our opening weekend for our new exhibit, The Power of Women in Country Music. So the party gets started at five o'clock. We hope to see you all there. Take care, everybody. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye. Bye.